Hello, BookTube. I have another starter kit for you today, and it's a starter kit near and dear to my heart. So near and dear to my heart that for a long time I thought maybe I had already made this starter kit. I don't think I have. I think the reason why I have that impression is because I've talked about this subject so much on my channel in various videos. I'm pulling it all together here as what the, uh, the 21st century loathsome people call a resource. <laughs> and this is a cryptid starter kit. And for those of you who might be new to the terminology, that refers to cryptozoology, uh, a branch of pseudoscience where a group of crackpot followers all over the world who believe that sometimes large but definitely uh, undiscovered animals exist in the world, that science is missing, that conventional science is the adjective they always add, is missing. Uh, the existence of the evidence for the existence of large, hitherto undiscovered creatures that have so far only been indicated by random scraps of after effects, tracks, or blurry photos, or that are embodied in folklore, but that actually do have their basis in reality. There are quite a few. There are a couple of cryptids that are, of course, famous all over the world, but they exist in their multitudes. And I have read an unhealthy amount of books on all kinds of cryptids and cryptozoology. So I wanted to give you a starter kit in case you want to break ground on that same subject. And we'll start with number 10. And that is the kind of thing that so many people ask me for when I talk about this or any other subject, which is, what's a good overview? If I want something big and broad. And for this, I want, I want to recommend uh, Courtney Shepard's book, A Field Guide to the Cryptids, where he goes through all a large... Over, overarching categories of cryptids and also goes into specific details about specific ones, much as we're going to do. Uh, he goes through that all in an overarching thing and uh, gives you about as serviceable uh, an overview of whatever cryptozoology is as you could possibly want. And it's also fairly readable. So I want to recommend A Field Guide to the Cryptids by Courtney, Courtney Shepard. But then we're going to get into specific cryptids. <laughs> and when we talk about specific cryptids, there are some varying yardsticks that have to come into play. <laughs> Unfortunately, they have to come into play. I want to believe, as the saying went for the X-Files, but many, many, many kinds of chupacabra, uh, man, chupacabra, many, many kinds of cryptids, uh, including my first choice, which is, of course, the chupacabra, many kinds of cryptids uh, simply aren't possible. And just physically, they aren't possible. If you take as your starting assumption in cryptozoology, methodological naturalism, which you absolutely have to do. <laughs> you absolutely have to do that. Otherwise, you are talking about spirits. You're talking about goblins. You're talking about the supernatural. And if you're talking about the supernatural, then no kind of ology should follow what you're saying except theology. If you're claiming that something has a physical existence in the world as an animal species, then methodological material naturalism should apply. Uh, and so quite a few cryptids are ruled out right away, either because their, their actual physical reality is completely impossible or because their actual physical reality is really well understood. It's, it's easy to tell what it is, and you just have to add all sorts of ungovernable categories to make it anything more than that. And the first one is, is what, I, what I mentioned there, my Freudian slip, the Chupacabra from Puerto Rico, uh, which began reports as dead bodies. And you, you, there are photographs of those dead bodies. This is a comparatively recent thing. And the photographs are easily diagnosable. They're easily understandable. They are pitiful creatures. They're dogs who died of mange. So for a long, they were naked, as soon as the main shark, they lost all their fur. But in addition to that, it drove them crazy. And the skin was also incapacitated as a defense organ. So they were often horribly infected and abraded and whatnot. And in many, many cases, chupacabra photographs were not only all of those things, but were also old. They had been desiccated by the sun, maybe even been at by scavengers. If you take a picture of a poor dog that suffered like that and died, it's not going to look like a dog. It's going to look otherworldly, and that's what all chupacabra photos are of dead chupacabras. That's what they all are. And those dead, pho those photographs of dead animals preceded the bulk of the stories of encountering live animals, of live version. And that's where they come from. 
they, they, the accounts of live chupacabra flow from pictures of dead chupacabra in easily diagnosable concentric circles. They are connected to each other. And, you know, you might say, well, if uh, the creatures that are in those photographs are so indistinct, so, so unbelievably morphed from what anything that a dog could look like by a process that you yourself are describing, how do you know they are dogs? I'm trusting that no one watching this channel is asking that question. There is nothing that you could do to a dog that would not make it immediately recognizable to me. I, the photographs that I've seen are dogs. Horrible, horrible dogs who suffered for their whole life and then suffered in the dying. But nevertheless, chupacabra, the evidence can be dismissed. The possibility that there's a dog-sized creature that lives in the wilds of Puerto Rico, I guess that's possible. But when you're talking about that possibility, you are bringing up another concept in addition to methodological naturalism, which means methodological naturalism is just a big a uh, multi-syllable phrase for the way all things work is the way all things work. So if you're looking around you and you're seeing that squirrels meet with other squirrels, mate, have litters, live, grow old, die, become prey animals, get hit by the side of the road, you're looking at that with cattle, you're looking at that with birds and the trees. Methodological naturalism says not only has that always been the way things are, so there were never any ogres, but that's the way things are even for the things we don't know about yet. They are still like that. They are still living organisms. If you accept methodological naturalism in order to study crypto cryptozoology, which if you don't, you're a crackpot. That's all. And uh, cryptozoology is full up to its eyeballs in crackpots. I'm not, I'm not saying that they're the rare exception. But there are people who want to pursue cryptozoology accepting methodological naturalism. I think that makes it more exciting, although it immediately rules out a lot of the things that you and I might like to believe are true. And the other thing that rules those things out is a phrase that is going to come up throughout this starter kit, and that is breeding populations. And it goes hand in hand with methodological naturalism. In, in nature, there are no single individuals, except in zoos. Or, or in game preserves, where we know where the one last black rhino is, but otherwise, and we know how they got that way. We know because people in living memory can remember when there were ten of them, a hundred of them, a thousand of them, a herd of them. You, That's why they're alone. And there's nothing else that's alone in nature. There's nothing else that's alone because you need a breeding population. Thousands of individuals, not just one. <laughs> you can't have just one. You need a breeding population. And, uh, well, that's going to come up. <laughs> that's going to come up. But first we, we can deal with, uh, we'll deal with Chupacabra is number nine. And Chupacabra can be ruled out. It's fun to read about, but it can be, and it, it, the fantasies about it are fun as well. But it can be ruled out because it was born from photographic evidence that clearly is one thing. And that thing is not monstrous. It's not unknown to science. Uh, the second thing, number eight on our list for this starter kit, is the dog man. Uh, from the uh, from the upper Midwest here in America, uh, it exists in, in a bunch of other places as well. But it, the the nuclear center, the narrative center of the story, is the upper Midwest, and it is essentially uh, a kind of it's the template for a werewolf. But dogmen don't become dogmen at a full moon. There's the people who want these things to be real say there is no supernatural element to them. It's just an element. It's some sort of uh, roughly canid creature that can go on two legs, either all the time or some of the time, and that lives in in the wilderness areas around the Great Lakes, the, the upper Midwest, the border of Canada. Uh, numerous eyewitness accounts, numerous attempts at uh, eyewitness sketches, even a, a try, an attempt at a picture here and there. Uh, I've mentioned the, the dog man possibility in an earlier video of mine and said the simple uh, disproving thing here is me all by myself. <laughs> it's not photographic evidence or the lack thereof. It's not eyewitness testimony or the inconsistencies therein. It's that I have tracked myself over every inch of ground where the dogman has been reported. And I have done it with a large group of canines, only some of whom were dogs. And there is no possibility at all that there could have been a canine or semi-canine creature 
anywhere around that I wouldn't have known about instantly, that I wouldn't have known about instantly. It's just not possible. Uh, I think that the explanation here, as in so many cases, is that the person saw a bear. <laughs> the person saw a bear. Bears can can act and move differently than you think. And if it's in half light or even full dark, out, just after the sun has gone down, and you aren't expecting to see something, uh, that can do a lot to your, your alarm can do a lot to your perception of your surroundings. But whatever the, the reason is, I think we can rule out the dog man. But nevertheless, there is a book on the subject. I've read quite a few books. The one that I want to recommend in is, uh, oh wait, I recommended, I didn't recommend for the Chupacabra. I just ruled it out. The book I want to recommend for Chupacabra is Tracking the Chupacabra by Benjamin Radford, uh, which is pretty good and delves heavily into, into, uh, you know, the anecdotal evidence and, and how you can interpret that. And the same thing is true with My Search for Dogman by Jim Hoffman, which is the book that I would recommend for the Dogman. My Search for Dogman looks at folklore. It looks at, uh, again, it digs deeply into the into the, the narrative inconsistencies, let's just put it that way, of the eyewitness testimony, and never completely closes the door. I'm closing the door right here, but they, they don't. And then we can move on. Uh, number seven in our cryptozoology uh, starter kit is about one of the least likely cryptids of them all, and that is the Thunderbird. <laughs> I don't know how many of you will know this. It's, again, mostly American. Uh, and it is the persistent cryptozoological belief that there exists a bird, a flying bird, that is the size of an airliner. <laughs> uh and leaving out the physics of flight here, of pinioned flight, of boned flesh and blood flight. We'll leave out the physics of flight just for a minute here. They are, a little spoiler here, completely rule out the existence of such a thing. But let's rule that out just for now. Let's leave out the physics of flight and just concentrate on that phrase again, that pesky phrase, breeding population. You know, we're not just talking about one thunderbird. And what we're talking about here is a bird uh, that's, as as big as uh, a city bus, even twice that size. This is as big as a building that has a, a wingspan of 100 feet. Sometimes people, witnesses will say, we're talking about something that absolutely could not be hidden under any circumstances, and that would leave behind an enormous amount of physical evidence. An enormous amount. Bones, claws, beaks. Another thing that birds tend to leave behind in large amounts, it would be, if you think your car is splattered poorly by a pigeon, <laughs> imagine having a dump truck the size to splatter on your windshield. It would crush your car. There, are, there is no possibility at all that there is a breeding population of birds the size of airline, of, of jet airliners. There is no possibility of that at all. <laughs> that cannot possibly be. You would need a breeding population. It would be an animal living here in the American, in, in North America. It would be an animal species living here. And it, since it's a bird, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't get the jet out, get out of jail free card that cryptids sometimes give to other cryptids on our list, which is a sort of precautionary intelligence. The Thunderbird is just a bird, so it's not going to know to hide itself from humans, not that it could anyway, with drones in the air, with every college kid getting a drone for graduation. No, the Thunderbird is simply impossible. It cannot be at all. Nevertheless, there have been many, many books on the subject, and I want to recommend one. It's called A Guide to Sky Monsters by T.S. Mart, M-A-R-T. And believe it or not, it's really good. It doesn't deal, as you can tell from the title, it doesn't deal just with Thunderbirds. They get a lot of attention, but uh, there are lots and lots of other stories about Thunderbirds. I think I know, again, the origin of these things. Any of you have ever been out hiking uh, off trail, you know, in, you know, in the woods, uh, will probably know that there is a particular feeling that you get when you watch a big bird of prey part from the foliage and heave itself into the air to fly off. Almost always, you don't know they're there until they move themselves and fly. All the time, they are not interested in you. And always, when that happens, it's happened to me a hundred times, two hundred times, uh, there's always the sensation at first 
that the bird is enormous, that the bird is as big as a bear or as big as an elephant. There's always that sensation because it's not fast. We are accustomed to bird wings flapping fast. And we're, we've, we scale that so that we think when something happens slow, it must be huge. Birds of prey, when, they are, when they're sunning themselves on an upper branch like that and they decide it's time to move on, all they want to do is get aloft. Mostly the air currents will do the rest. So they don't necessarily flap like crazy when they're taking off. It can be a very languid look. And that always, even in me, that always produces the immediate sensation that what you're looking at is much bigger than what it really is. Then in sane people who maybe don't have a lot of bourbon while they're out hiking, immediately your sense of perspective takes over and you realize, oh no, that it was startling, but no, it's, it's just an eagle. <laughs> anyway. Uh, let's move on. <laughs> let's move on. Let's let's get back down to the ground for a little while and deal with a couple of very similar things. Uh, number six on our list of cryptids is the Beast of Bray Road. <clears throat> uh, some of you will know this animal. Some of you may be listening to this video right near the area of Bray Road again here in America, here in the American Upper Midwest. Uh, this is a stretch of territory where there is apparently a... a savage and hitherto unknown uh, carnivore. The descriptions vary. A lot of the descriptions are very close to something that you would associate with a dog man. Others are very close to something you would associate with a lion or a large uh, cat, an apex cat, a feline cat, a predator. Uh, and the story took off uh, and was written up by a, a former journalist named Linda Godfrey. And her book is called The Beast of Bray, of Bray Road, and it's by far the best thing done. She's a terrific writer. Some of you may remember that name from this channel. She wrote a book called, a much later book than The Beast of Bray Road, called I Know What I Saw, which is also about cryptids. I think I wrote a review of I Know What I Saw. If I did, I'll try to remember to leave a link to it down below. But uh, it's very engaging. Uh, and once again, it draws on legitimate credulity, I guess we could call it. Because you have to keep in mind that until just comparatively very recently, comparatively, relatively speaking, until just comparatively very recently, explorers, white explorers in Africa, heard all sorts of stories from the natives about a gigantic ape, a gorilla. And the white explorers routinely dismissed it as local folklore. Even when the first very grainy blink and you miss it, video image of a gorilla from a great distance was promulgated in, in Europe and America, experts tended to dismiss it. That's a man. That's, there, isn't, there are no apes in the world that are that big. And then the gorilla was discovered, documented by science. Same thing is true with the bonobos, the billy ape. These things are, these things are comparatively very recent discoveries of comparatively very large animals. <laughs> who did have a breeding population and who had been immortalized in local folklore. That is the linchpin on which cryptozoologists tend to place a lot of their hopes <laughs> on that fact, on the fact that science doesn't know everything and has been caught not knowing everything on a number of different occasions. That's when you have to bring in the rule. It's okay to say that about the Beast of Bray Road. Could there be some sort of unknown predator in that area not not unknown in the sense of the species but unknown in the sense that we don't know there's one there like for instance i don't even know an escaped circus animal of some kind or maybe maybe a circus went through that part of the upper midwest a hundred years ago and that circus had as many of them did a whole uh act of lions We've got two big African lions. We've got two males with the big with the big mane, and maybe six or seven lionesses, and they're all in a group. And the whole gimmick, the whole trick of the show, the whole thing that gets the 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 rubes to pay their money, is that you have all of those lions on stools, waving their paws and walking in line and whatnot. If the two male lions aren't related, and if even two of the lionesses aren't related. You could have a breeding population that would last for 100 years if all of them got loose. <laughs> Do we know for sure that that didn't happen? Do we know for sure that some wealthy railroad magnate from New York didn't, didn't buy himself a tract of land somewhere in Michigan or Ohio or wherever 
that no one knew about, that he wanted no one to know about, and maybe he imported animals and raised them in a kind of compound just for the fun of it. What happens when he dies? Whether they kill him or not, well, maybe they get out. Maybe they, they start to breed. Is it possible that such a thing could exist in the area of Bray Road and maybe not be documented? It is theoretically possible. Certainly some of the eyewitnesses of the Beast of Bray Road line up and don't seem like they're in it for the limelight. So you should read Linda Godfrey's book, and I would also recommend I Know What I Saw, which is also terrific. Uh, and as long as we're talking about the Beast of Bray Road, we can move 5,000 miles to the east and talk about the Beast of Exmoor, uh, which is uh, in England, and it is a very similar thing, except with the Beast of Exmoor, there are almost no implications of the supernatural. The Beast of Bray Road, there are plenty. <laughs> there are plenty of implications, in, of, of slight implications of the supernatural. The Beast of Exmoor is clearly just a large cat. A very large cat, a panther of some kind. It's universally described as jet black. Could very well be that that someone, for some reason, either accidentally or on purpose, loosed a black panther in the area of Exmoor and is trying to survive as best it can and has simply not been caught. That's entirely possible. Black panthers tend to be smaller than people think they are. Uh, they're much, much bigger than a house cat, but they're not bigger. They're not that much bigger than, for instance, Matthew's house cats at Mayberry Book Club. They, they, they're not anything like the size of a lion. So in the area, it is theoretically possible that such a thing could exist. The question with the, with the beast of Exmoor is breeding population. We get back to breeding population. It doesn't seem to me likely unless the breeding population is being replenished. Uh, by very irresponsible mischief makers. But there is a book. Uh, there is a book. It's by Di Francis. D.I. Francis. And it's simply called The Beast of Exmoor. And it's terrific. I don't know how available it is in America. But it's well worth your time to read. Even if you just want to be brought up to speed. I'm not saying that any of these books are any better than going down a rabbit hole of these things on YouTube. Uh, some of these books were written before YouTube existed. Uh, but cryptids are big on YouTube. They are, they are big on YouTube. I haven't done the legwork for most of these in that regard, but I'm sure that there are healthy sized rabbit holes for you to go down for all of them. Uh, but now that we're done with the Beast of Bray Road and the Beast of Exmoor, we will go uh, back to semi-avian type creature. <laughs> uh, and that is the Mothman. Uh, and there is a book. Uh, there's a book called uh, The Mothman Prophecies. Uh, by John Keel. It's a famous book, probably one of the most famous books on our list here. And it deals with a large, a large creature that certainly does not exist, a man-sized creature or bigger, uh, that has glowing eyes and, and maybe antennas and wings, big wings on its back. The Mothman, more than probably anything else uh, on this list, the Mothman uh, is supernatural. It's always credited with greater than human intelligence. It's always credited with nefarious intent. It's always basically a demon. Uh, so I, I hesitated whether or not to put it on this list, but there have been a huge number of anecdotal sightings. To my mind, most of the sightings are, are suspect. Uh, most of the people seem to know about the Mothman mythos and want to be adding to it, as opposed to the kind of eyewitness where it's just an ordinary person and they saw something they do not understand. That's a different thing, and uh, I don't see that much in the Mothman uh, legendarium. <laughs> but but John Keel's book, The Mothman Prophecies, is famous. It, it, so in, a, in its own culture circles, it's famous. So I thought I'd recommend it. Uh, and then uh, we're going to finish up with the biggies, <laughs> the big two of uh, cryptozoology. You already know what they are. That is uh, uh, the Loch Ness Monster. And Bigfoot. And the Loch Ness Monster we've been over on this channel a few times. It is allegedly a beast, a very big beast, a city bus sized beast that lives in Loch Ness in Scotland. Uh, it, it, like with Dogman or Chupacabra uh, or even the Thunderbird, uh, what I'm talking about here is, is the most famous example of a large subset of lake monsters. There's virtually no large lake anywhere in the world that doesn't have reports or a legend about a monster that lives in its depths. Virtually none. Uh, I'm not going to address every one of them. I'm just going to lump them all together uh, 
while talking about Loch Ness. And I've talked about the Loch Ness monster a few times here. I've been to Loch Ness. And the, the legends about Loch Ness, the Loch Ness monster are, most of them say that it comes out of the loch to feed. That is totally impossible. <laughs> that is totally impossible. There isn't enough forage around Loch Ness to keep a herd of cattle alive for a season. Much less the standard explanation for the Loch Ness Monster is a plesiosaur, <laughs> which is a gigantic ichthyosaur that would need a huge amount. It would need at least its own weight in food every day. There is no possibility whether the animal feeds on fish in Loch Ness or whether it feeds on vegetation outside of Loch Ness or even if it feeds on livestock outside of Loch Ness. There is no way possible that the area could sustain a, what's the word? Breeding population. There's no way possible that that could happen. You have to say, if you're talking about Loch Ness Monster being a real thing, you are forced to say that it is one animal. And it can't be one animal. It can't be. If we are talking about cryptozoology instead of just flights of fancy, if we're, talking about, if we're trying to give cryptozoology as much respectability as we can, it has to adhere to methodological naturalism, which means there can't be just one. There has to be a breeding population of these animals, and it has to go back forever. It has to be an animal that evolved from, uh, from earlier ancestors and that has a place in the fossil record. If you say otherwise, if you say that it's an extraterrestrial visitor or something like that, then you can say anything you want, but don't, don't call it any branch of science or even pseudoscience. Just, you're just making up stories. You're making up mythology. Plenty of cryptozoologists don't want that associated with them. They want to try for real. They really do believe, and they think they have re legitimate, rational reason to believe. Well, okay. The only way I'm going to get on board with even discussing that with you is if we can agree that what's real is real, and that everything that's real behaves the way it always did. <laughs> that methodological naturalism, in other words, applies. If it doesn't, if you're saying, well, yes, all other animals behave this way, but this one animal is immortal, or can slip in and out of dimensions or something like that, <laughs> then you can go ahead and have that conversation with friends of yours that have those religious beliefs, but not with me and not with a lot of the serious devotees, researchers is their word, uh, for these kinds of things. And the, if you use methodological naturalism, there cannot possibly be a monster in Loch Ness. There cannot possibly be, especially not the size, the dimensions that are typically given to this thing. It would need to feed on a ton of food a day, at least. There isn't anything nearby. That would be visible. That kind of carnage would be visible. Not to mention the fact that every single proposed identity for this thing has been an air breather. If you have a breeding population, that means you have many, 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 many adults, many children, many adolescents, territorial battles, sexual battles... All in in a lake that in many parts of the year is perfectly visible for long stretches of its length. There's no possibility you could sit there in one hour. It wouldn't be a question of, of you bilking the local visitors to take a boat out and maybe they see a bird or something like that. You could sit on the dock and watch these things broaching for air, breaching for air. <laughs> you could watch them do it. It wouldn't be a question of looking for evidence. Uh, so it, it cannot happen. Not just for that reason, but also, as I mentioned, because Loch Ness in its geological history is frozen solid. Oh, many times in its geological history, it is frozen solid. So where did the Loch, where did Nessie go <laughs> while that was happening? And some devotees will say, well, okay, maybe the record that shows that Loch Ness froze solid several times in its history is wrong. Or if it did, if the record's right and it did, maybe the, the monsters fled through an, a subterranean passage to the ocean and came back when the coast was clear. <laughs> they would have been breeding in the ocean. They wouldn't all have come back. What are they, uh, texting each other? <laughs> There'd be some left in the ocean. There are plenty of people who say there are, but no. <laughs> no, there aren't. There isn't, it isn't possible at all. And another thing that, uh, that works against Loch Ness, works against all lake monsters, which is that, in my experience, just personally again, most people that live near a large body of water don't know anything about it. Nothing at all. You'll have a handful of people who live near a natural body of water, a big lake, uh, that do know a lot about it. But most people don't. And they still live near there. They still, they still vacation on that body of water or live on that body of water, but they know nothing about it. They know nothing at all or virtually nothing about the animals that live and depend on that lake. The land animals that live and depend on that lake. And that's why they're there, because that lake is there. 
Most humans that live in the vicinity of a large body of water don't have any idea what that is like, and even more so, they don't know what lives in the lake. Is the lake connected to another large body of water? Is it connected to the ocean? They don't know. They have no idea. And what lives in the lake that you look at every day? What lives in that water? Do you have any idea what the biggest thing that lives in that water is? Most people have no idea whatsoever. None whatsoever. And if they don't, if they see the slightest thing they aren't expecting, they're automatically going to assume all kinds of fantastical things. You who are listening to me, do you have any idea how big a sturgeon gets? Do you know what a sturgeon is? Do you know if you live near a sturgeon? And if you do know what a sturgeon is, do you know how big they get? Do you know how agile they are? Do you know what they look like when they're resting at the surface? Do you know what they, you, what they look like when they're moving quickly just beneath the surface? I, in most cases with people I have known who live near large bodies of water, the answer to all those questions is no. Well, if that's the case, <laughs> then when you see something weird, you're not going to think about what is most likely true. And that is true in most of, the, most of the lake monsters that I have examined the evidence in Africa or in Asia or especially in America. In most of those cases, most people don't have any idea what lives in that body of water already, what, what science already understands and that lives in that body of water. So the testimonies go out the window. Uh, but I still want to recommend a book. And that book is A Monstrous Commotion by Gareth Williams. A Monstrous Commotion. Quite an entertaining book. Very good. Worth your time to read, even though I am telling you that the book is actually about nothing. In some of these cases, maybe. The Beast of Exmoor, maybe. I've seen some of the more popular film footage, more some of the more well-known eyewitness accounts. They tally. They're not asking anything outrageous. The area could support a couple of large felines who kept themselves hidden, hunted mostly at night. The area could do that. I doubt very much there's a healthy breeding population, but it's possible. The Loch Ness Monster? No. <laughs> no it is not possible. Nevertheless, there have been many good books on the subject. I wanted to recommend A Monstrous Commotion as one of the, one of the really good ones. Uh, then the last specific cryptid that we're going to deal with uh, is one you've already seen coming, and that is Bigfoot. <laughs> the Yeti. The Alma. The Sasquatch. The persistent folkloric and pseudoscientific belief all over the world that there is a large man-like creature, sentient man-like creature, that lives in the deep forests and deep, uh, deep mountain ridges and ranges of the world. And that is smart enough to stay away from humans, smart enough to be cautious around them, smart enough to hide all trace of themselves. All of the get-out-of-jail-free cards that don't apply with a gigantic bird, for instance, or a gigantic moth, or something like that. When you're talking about a human species, which is basically what every Sasquatch follower is saying, they're pretty much saying this is not an ape. In the sense of, you know, a gorilla or an orangutan, this is, a, this is a, an ancestor of humans. This is a kind of human. Uh, in the genus Homo. Once you start to say that, which almost every Bigfoot researcher does, then you introduce the possibility that this thing is hidden for a reason. Because of all the things on this list, aside from poor Loch Ness and the Thunderbird, which is ridiculous as well, this is the thing that would be hardest to hide. And that's despite the evidence of bonobos or the Billy Ape. This would be the hardest to hide. Because again, we'd be talking about a breeding population. Maybe a migrating population, uh, maybe a tool-using population of anthropoids of, of fairly large size. They are almost always reported to be much bigger than humans. They would leave lots and lots of evidence. There would be huge amounts of detritus that we could study. And Bigfoot researchers, the true believers among them, will say there is. How many, how many new uh, tracks, scat, hair, are, uh, footprints are found every year? There is a mountain of evidence. Okay. All right. I'm not dismissing that. That was the evidence for things like gorillas until they were seen, until they were caught on camera. And Bigfoot researchers would say, it's also been caught on camera. There's everything here except a, a living specimen. Okay. All right. That's absolutely true. Those are kinds of evidence. Uh, but... <laughs> uh, it seems to me that there's a reason why so many Bigfoot researchers start out that way and eventually say that these things are extra-dimensional visitors, that they are angels of a type, that they have 
extra wisdom and supernatural powers and the ability to vanish and reappear in our plane of reality. A lot of people that start out talking about scat and tracks move on to that. And I think the reason why they do is because the preponderance of evidence is against this. It just is. I want to believe in it as much as anybody. But how many thousands of people go hiking in the Pacific Northwest, Cascade Rage, wherever, every year now with high-definition cameras, with telephoto capability in their pockets at all times? How many of them do that? And never a hint? Never anything that's, that's any clearer than a blur in the distance? The fact that there is no incontrovertible evidence here I think damns the whole thing. After all this time, with all these people looking, I think it just damns the whole thing. I have seen all of the video footage, all of the clips, oh god, more of them than I can count. And in every single case, uh, the minute the thing, the furry thing through the thicket of forest starts to move, as opposed to fidgeting, the minute it gets up and starts to move, the camera filming immediately stops. And... I have always maintained, and I do maintain, unfortunately, reluctantly to this day, I think the reason the filming stops in all of those instances is because it's at that moment that the filmer realized they were agitating a bear. <laughs> and those of you who have not gone camping or hiking, it's a very bad idea to agitate a bear. It's a very bad idea. It's a bad idea if it's a black bear. Black bears will mostly run away, and they're kind of your size. They're much stronger than you are, but they're not, they're not freaks. They, they don't want to fight. They'll, if you disturb them, they'll largely just crash through the forest in the opposite direction. But it could also be a grizzly bear. And grizzly bears are ever so much bigger than black bears, and they're always in a bad mood. <laughs> so it's a bad idea to agitate a bear, even with a telephoto lens from a distance away. A bear can cover that ground before you can draw a breath. Certainly before you can chamber around. It, they're incredibly fast. And if the bear is in a very bad mood, and grizzly bears always are, they will cover that ground, or they could. You don't know one way or another. You could die, in other words, and not at the hands of a Bigfoot. All these people out there in the woods, all of them hoping to catch a glimpse of this thing and become the most famous person in the world, to, uh, for, to be spoken of in the same breath as Patterson and Gimlin, as somebody who allegedly filmed one of these things, to have the chance to do that, you would not look away like that unless you knew bloody well what you were looking away from and it was a bear who doesn't care if you get on the evening news because he's going to eat your face <laughs> i i myself don't think i hate to say it but i i would like to believe that there is a giant kind of anthropoid that lives in deep forests and swamps all across america but i think it would be known by now i think there would be a clear unambiguous photo by now and there is not even one. <laughs> but nevertheless, there's been a huge amount of writing on the subject. And I wanted to give you a few recommendations. I made one just the other day called Sasquatch Legend Meets Science by Jeff Meldrum, who's a serious scientist and a heck of a nice guy, and nobody's fool, and thinks there is something to this. He is a, a professional who has looked at all of that secondhand physical evidence and said, even by preponderance of weight, there's too much of this to dismiss. This can't all be pranks. This can't all be wrong. Enough of these chunks of fur have come back, uh, donor unknown, to suggest that there's something going on here, that there's something we don't know here. He's a serious, sober guy, and his book is, in my opinion, uh, the best serious inquiry into the subject. But there are other books, too. There, there are other books that sort of look at the atmosphere of it all. I want to recommend those as well. One that I've, uh, that I've uh, recommended quite a bit on this channel, and I wrote a review of it. I had a great time. This is called In the Valleys of the Noble Beyond by John Zadow, which is him going into the very thickest Bigfoot territory to talk to the people in the diners and the truck stops, to talk to the true believers, to talk to the skeptics, to talk to campers and uh, camp wardens and whatnot about this. It's very anecdotal. It's very atmospheric. It's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And I also want to recommend On the Trail of Bigfoot by Mike Dupler which is another classic. There are only a handful of truly good classics about Bigfoot that aren't crazy. And Dupler's book is great. Just fantastic. You, you will be intrigued and you will read along with all of these things. Uh, and I said that was the last cryptid we were going to do. Of course we're going to go out with Bigfoot. Uh, because unlike the Loch Ness Monster, there is a shadow of a chance that something here is true. Now, despite the size that's always reported of Bigfoot, 
a u almost universal figure of Bigfoot anecdotal reports that happen by their hundreds every year in America alone. An almost universal feature of those reports is that this thing is much bigger than a human being. Most of the time these animals are seen in, at twilight or at night by people who are frightened and sometimes intoxicated and sometimes both. That increases size. My own theory about Bigfoot is that there is indeed an anthropoid living in these areas, but that it's feral humans who aren't any much bigger than a normal human. They're just, their size is exaggerated because they're unexpected and they don't look right. They're probably wearing homemade furs or maybe have developed kind of fur of their own. I think we, if we were talking generations of feral humans, uh, I think that would make a lot of sense, especially in terms of all of the anecdotal stories about Bigfoot's uh, abducting women. There are many, many stories like that don't make any sense. They don't make any sense in terms, in, anthropologically speaking, they don't make any sense. They make a whole lot of sense if you've got a feral population of humans. And a feral population of humans, of actual homo sapiens, would have all of the precautionary cultural things to stay hidden from humans. I'm not 100% sure that uh, you know, a gigantopithecus would know to hide its tracks and remove its dead skeletons from the side of the road or, or go back to the place where a bear killed one of their children in order to remove the children's bones from the site. I'm not sure that an Australopithecus would have the mental capacity to do that. Uh, or a Gigantopithecus. I'm not sure that they would. We don't know a whole lot, uh, everything we'd like to know about their mental capacity, but I don't think it's enough to do that, much less all the time. Whereas a feral population of humans that wanted to stay hidden would have the ability to do that. The only thing missing from that explanation is the consistent report of size. And I think that could be chalked up to nerves, much as anything else. But now that we've finished with Bigfoot, you might think that we're finished with cryptozoology. But no, my cryptozoology starter kit has to start, has to finish uh, with the death knell of cryptozoology. I had to do it. I want to believe this stuff as much as anybody, but... <laughs> I want to give the final word to two scientists. And the book is called Abominable Science. It's by Daniel Loxton and the great Donald Prothero, the great curmudgeon Donald Prothero. And it takes a look at almost everything that we're talking about on this list and blows holes out of uh, blows them all to shreds. Every single one of them just blows them to shreds. Uh, it's painful reading if you, like me, want to believe, but you got to do it. You got to do it. We have to stick to rationality here. No matter what we want to believe, it is fun to believe, and it's go ahead and read to your heart's content. Talk to me about it to your heart's content. Watch as many YouTube videos, fuzzy and out of focus YouTube videos as you want. I do the same thing. It's such a thrill to think these things might be real. But we have to give the scientists the last word, and they say no. <laughs> they say no, none of it is real. None of it is real. Now, I have made my cases in the course of this video that maybe some of it is. Maybe there is an explanation for some of these things. I don't think the explanation will ever be what a lot of the aficionados say it is, but it could be that something is not yet known. Science has made some of those rude discoveries just recently, comparatively speaking. It is possible. Uh, Luxon and especially Prothero do not want you to know. They do not want to end the discussion with that. They think there are enough wonderful things in the world that science knows about and is studying that we don't need to multiply with obvious myths. Abominable Science is a terrific book. It's on heavy stock paper and it's full of illustrations. And you might be arguing with it the whole time, but I have to give the last word to methodological naturalism. I have to give the last word to rationality. Uh, so we're gonna, I'm going to end with Abominable Science. That is, that is also a very strong recommend for cryptozoology of all kinds, even though it packs up cryptozoology and stuffs it in the crypt. <laughs> Still worth your time. Very much worth your time. So there you go. That is a cryptid starter kit. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to wrap this up. It's gone on way too long. I can talk for 10 hours on this subject. I'm, I'm going to wrap this up for now, uh, but I will be back. Thank you, BookTube.